Let us pray. Ninety years of sermons and hymns and anthems and prayers. Ninety years of ministry among the fellowship of the Riverside Church and out into the surrounding community. Ninety years of meetings. Ninety years of prophetic witness to the creation, to the wholesomeness of creation, to the image of God on every face, to the bringing of peace and justice and the breaking of chains. We thank you, God, for this rich history. And we pray, knowing that you are with us now, as we celebrate this moment and look forward to the future. As in all times past, we pray to hear your word amidst all the noise all around us. Speak that word into our hearts and minds, even now. In Christ we pray, amen. Amid the impressiveness and beauty of this sanctuary, it behooves us all to remember that Christianity began in a carpenter shop. 6,000 people lined Riverside Drive hoping to get a seat to hear the first words preached in this church on October 5th, 1930, to see the magnificent stained glass windows surrounding the nave, to hear the organ, now 149 stops, 207 ranks, 12,000 pipes dedicated in 1955 in a concert with the New York Philharmonic Orchestra. In contrast to the Gothic grandeur of the church, Harry Emerson Fosdick described the life of Jesus as set in impoverished circumstances. Nothing moved him, Fosdick preached, more deeply than economic wrong. Victims robbed and left untended by the roadside. Lazarus lying at the rich man's gate. Widows despoiled of their houses by the rapacity of rulers. He was indignantly concerned about economic ills. He would walk through our mills and factories, mingle with frightened victims of unemployment, lay his hands on wounded personality, and say to us, do you have to do such things as this to men and women and boys and girls to make your money? Riverside's course was set. This gospel that animates Christian life is not alone about abundant life for real persons, personality, as Fosdick put it, the gospel never could lead to a small and narrow individualism. Upon the contrary, it leads out into a broad social humanism. Today is World Communion Sunday. Though not yet established, Riverside's and Fosdick's inaugural service, his first sermon in this building, fell on this day, the first Sunday of October. Fosdick wondered what Jesus would make of all the branches of faith claiming him their head. He preached that Sunday, does it matter to be baptized with more water or less? It does not. Does it matter to live under this polity or that? It does not. Does it matter to have been a vehement Episcopalian or Congregationalist? It does not. 
Contemporary Protestantism is all cluttered up with things that make no deep difference in life. God is over all and in all. And ahead of us, hope like a sun forever rising and never going down. That does it, he preached. And Riverside's course was set interdenominational, international. Now I have to issue a warning here. This is the part of the sermon where all those who have written to me to say, stop talking about politics, should tune out, go on mute, and wait for a hand signal that I'm done. But of course, there won't be a hand signal because the gospel cannot be preached without talking about politics. So after that warning, not apology, that warning, here goes, World Communion Sunday. How bitter are the elements this Sunday. This Sunday, the world watched this past week the current male president of the United States shout, interrupt, demean, lie repeatedly about himself and his record. We can only feel shame about what the whole world witnessed. He demeaned other countries by name, China, his favorite target, and many nations by implication, all those in the Paris Accord, for example. 88 nations without the United States, from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe. An agreement of the world to reduce the deadly emissions that threaten all life on and the planet itself. He refused to show half an ounce of empathy when Biden talked about the son he and Jill lost in war, Bo. So targeted was he on repeating discredited charges against the Biden's other son, Hunter. And Van Jones says there was only one takeaway from the debate. And you know what he meant. Trump's refusal to denounce racism and white supremacy. He chose rather to encourage the proud boys to stand back and stand by, my God, for what? This movement was behind the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995. They were in Charlottesville in 2017 and Portland continuously since George Floyd was murdered. Can there be any doubt except, except among his most rabid followers that he is unfit to lead a family, much less a nation. And even among those who support him, there ought to be grave doubt about his fitness to continue. Knowing one of his closest aides was infected with a virus that kills, that has killed over a million people worldwide, 215,000 in this country. He went to a fundraising event and made a speech. Well, that's what a quarter million dollars will get you. Dinner with a man who'll take your money and risk your health with a thank you, but no warning. Happy anniversary, Riverside. This is our nation and world. Caroline Randall Williams, a Vanderbilt University writer in residence in the Department of Medicine, Health, and Society, said on the Lawrence O'Donnell Show, Donald Trump is what happens when you make cosmetic renovations on a house built on unstable foundations. I was scrambling to remember and write 
and keep listening to her as she was speaking, and I couldn't quite get the last few words, so I'm saying it out loud. Donald Trump is what happens when you make cosmetic changes, and I'm writing furiously, hoping that the recitation, hoping hearing it out loud would help when my two days short of his 10th birthday grandson, Senai, finishes the sentence for me on a house built on unstable foundations, he said. You see, what we all know and have to remember, this is not about Donald Trump. He's talking not just to the world, but to our children. And they hear him. They know what his words mean for them. And I seem to recall Jesus talking about putting stones around the necks of those who harm children. They know, our children, this isn't about him. He wants us to think so, talking so often about my stable genius, my amazing business savvy, my, the best thing that ever happened to the blacks, to Puerto Rico, to incarcerated people, to women, to suburbia, to evangelicals, to Putin, to Puerto Rico, to proud boys. The best thing is me. When all he really means is what his actions say is, his presidency is the best thing that ever happened to him. Well, it's keeping him out of jail for now. Riverside's history is the story of great preachers confronting the leaders and issues of the day with the prophetic word of judgment of the Hebrew Bible and the gospel of good news of the New Testament. It is the story of lay members embodying progressive ideas and joining movements to transform our nation and notions of what is right and wrong and what justice requires as time marches on and in each moment of time. And today is no different. From Fosdick's pacifism, McCracken speaking out against racism, Campbell making the case for reparations, Coffin's leadership for nuclear disarmament, and Forbes's advocacy for the poor, we carry on. That's what Riverside does. If Braxton was not here long enough to establish a prophetic heritage, he has certainly since been a prophet of racial justice and inclusion. And Pastor Amy preached with passion for gender justice and women's rights and sought to reach out to a new generation of young people adrift from the church. Along the way, and starting as early as McCracken's years, Riverside drew growing numbers of people of color to worship black and brown until the full blooming of a black presence here attracted to the charismatic preaching of James Forbes. And praise God, Riverside led the church in the full inclusion of gays and lesbians in the life of the church and in the world. And our 90th anniversary is no excuse for abandoning our theme for this season and into the next, focusing on women's stories, women's vision and voices, too long overlooked, ignored, untold. So let's be honest, Riverside's history and certainly on the surface, and in the roll call of pulpit leadership has been a story of patriarchy, a tale of men. In the month of our 36th anniversary, McCracken preached, Behold the man, the man among men, the man for others, the church for all its faults and failings 
is the company of men pledged to follow Christ the man, the Lord, humanity at its highest. In its context, it must have been resounding, but it is painful to hear today. The 50th anniversary service during Coffin's time had nine participants in the chancel leading worship, only one of them a woman. Ms. Ruth Britton, with a notation that read, member of the Board of Trustees and chairperson of the Black Christian Caucus. That 50th anniversary program lists all the ministers, all the clergy of Riverside Church, each one ordained who served in leadership from 1930 until 1980. 19 of them 18 were men, one woman clergy in all those 50 years, Evelyn Newman, pastoral ministry, minister, 1976 to 1980. We've come quite some distance, but have so far to go. From Rockefeller to the long and nerd noteworthy interim leadership of Stephen Phelps, the narrative is dominated by men. Though the more recent history of Riverside could not be told without the contributions of women in leadership. Don't we all know that? Alleluia. Amen. My own short time here is a tale of work and the ministry of presence among remarkable lay women in and out of elected leadership. Intelligent, wise, thoughtful, dedicated, good-spirited, kind, spiritually gifted. Now my father warned me about coming, about becoming a name-calling preacher, but that's a rule meant to be broken on occasion. And I'm going to break it this morning. Alexa Donovan, Sumati Devadut, Hilda Clark, Evelyn Davis, Ida Montero, Jean Smith, Geraldine Howard, Marilyn Mitchell, Imogene Stamper, Zenobia Gray, Robbie Patterson. I could go on. Josephine Clark, Bose George. Luvon Roberson, Ruby Sprott, I could go on. There is no history of Riverside, certainly not in these later years, certainly not in those early years, without the voices and vision, without the contribution and leadership of women. Now, I haven't forgotten about the text, the Ten Commandments. I wanted to ground this 90th anniversary in the basics. The Ten Commandments are about as basic as you can get. And it's this simple. Is God going to be first? I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me or beside me? Or are we going to make an idol or idols that guarantee the failure of the promise of humanity? Because nothing else has worked and we are trying them all. Power, wealth, ego. And that one commandment is enough. One God, one creation, one humanity, one planet. What affects one affects all. There is enough for all of us if we respect and care for one another. But if we need one more, one more commandment, this one. 
you shall not kill. That is what we have been doing for all the centuries that matter since we should have known better. I won't bother to try to date that. We kill for power. We kill for wealth. We kill for ego. We know better. Can we become human beings to one another, all of us? Can we stop killing one another for every reason? Can we value life over ownership of material goods? Can we save the planet? on which all life depends. So I've preached about Eve and Rahel, and now Eleanor, not from the Bible, rather from Riverside's history, from the very beginning. Eleanor Fosdick down the daughter of Harry and Florence. She died at 108 years old this past April. She stopped driving a stick shift when she was 101 years old. When she graduated from Smith College, she wanted to study medicine, but she was told she wouldn't be admitted to medical school. She said, well, at least I can try. When she graduated from Johns Hopkins Medical School, she was told she wouldn't be able to get an internship. She said, well, at least I can try. She met her future husband during her residency at a hospital in Rochester. After his death in 1945, she raised two children, never remarrying. She practiced medicine, she taught, she did research. She became the associate dean at the School of Public Health at Columbia University. After retirement, she published papers in archeology, span which she studied at MIT. She became an award-winning artist. She wrote poetry. She made people laugh. She had to keep revising and updating her autobiography because she lived so long. She traveled the world making friends in the Arctic, Antarctica, China, the Amazon Basin, Africa, South America, and the Middle East. She had problems and challenges, she turned them into adventures. She didn't give a damn for power or wealth or ego. She hung her diplomas in her bathroom. She never killed anybody. I want to end this sermon as I have all others in this series by listening to a wise woman. Let's listen to Eleanor Fosdick Downs. My name is Eleanor Fosdick Downs, and I am 107 years old. I've been a member of the Riverside Church as long as it existed. When difficult events occurred, I tried to solve them or see them as 
adventures. But not all adventures are happy, but at least you don't know how they're going to come out, and you can deal with them. <clears throat> when your writers died, it was a challenge. But I had the family, which made a huge difference. Kept, kept the community of colleagues that I could count on. Be positive about all the bad things that happen. Turn them around, make adventures out of them, or learning situations. So much of it is luck. I don't think I set out to live a good life. It's just happened.